Hello, everyone. I'm from New York. I have to bring my bag with me. <laughs> I'm an immigrant. I'm a Muslim. I'm a woman. And I came to this country to find a cure for cancer. This was back in 1977. What have I been doing since then? I see 30 to 40 cancer patients every week. I have a research lab using the latest technology to interrogate human tissues for cancer research. Most importantly, I'm a cancer widow. My husband, who was from Brooklyn, headed the Rush University Cancer Center for 10 years and died of the very disease he had dedicated his life to cure since he was 15 years old, leukemia. Chicago means a lot to me. This is where I had my daughter, Shahrzad, who went to Park, Parker. This is where Harvey got ill and died. And the friendships I made here have sustained me. Many of those Chicago friends are here tonight. Thank you for coming. When I came to this country in 1977 and I started to study and treat patients with a disease called acute myeloid leukemia or AML. In 1977, we were using two drugs to treat AML, popularly known as seven and three, seven days of one, three days of another. Today in 2019, we are still using seven and three to treat AML. This is an embarrassment. What's worse is denying this embarrassment. Why is that? We boast of cutting and pasting DNA. Yet the treatment for cancer we are giving is paleolithic. It's the same slash poison and burn to this day. I have written this book called The First Cell. The idea is that we are losing the war on cancer because we keep trying to kill the last cancer cell. And that's end stage cancer. You know that when you tell someone, oh, my cousin or my friend has cancer, but don't worry, they were diagnosed early and it was taken care of. Everyone knows. Early detection is the key. So why aren't we doing early detection? And what is this? <laughs> what can we do better? So I'll read three two-minute segments from this book to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Let us first and foremost Accept with all humility that our job remains unfinished. I would go further and say, let us accept that the traditional ways of doing most things are sclerotic. My insistent focus on the granularity of individual pain and suffering in pages that follow is to highlight the urgent need for change, to force us as individuals and as a society to cast off the manacles of dogma. The burden of this book is to redraw the scientific route radically, to redirect our intellectual, technologic, physical and emotional faculties away from fundamentally flawed models, adding a few months to survival, instead to conceive and strive for the substance of things hoped for a real cure through early detection and prevention of cancer to go from the last cell to the first cell. 
But there is one and only one goal for all of us to ensure that all our intellectual efforts are directed towards the relief of humanity's suffering. Suffering is what I see on a daily basis and what I chronicle in the first cell. And where human suffering is concerned, scientific and emotional, medical and poetic impulses merge effortlessly and become inseparable. This synthesis, representing a rival paradigm of cancer research and treatment, even of writing about it, this dialogue of compassion, this science of empathy, of care and concern, can liberate us from the confident complacency of assumed righteousness in the way things are done. Liberate us from mental cages we have inadvertently imprisoned ourselves in. Our lives that are at stake, our future is at stake. Let new technology and new ideas rearrange our laboratories and our psyches, break the stalemate. Let us assume responsibility. Let us deconstruct what has become an indifferent science and reconstruct it through the prism of human anguish. I will quote Emily Dickinson here. I feel like Miss Dickinson is speaking directly to me when she wrote this poem. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they bore it long or did it just begin. I cannot find the date of mine, it's been so long a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try and whether could they choose between, they would not rather die. The two patients, so the book has got seven <coughs> chapters, each chapter is about a patient. There are two young men, Omar, 38 years old, who got an osteogenic sarcoma, and Andrew, 22 year old, who got a glioblastoma multiforme, a really vicious tumor of the brain. Omar, my best friend's son, Andrew, my daughter's best friend, both 22 years old. What happened to them? And what role did we play in this? I'd like to read just a short piece about them. Classic Greek canon places great emphasis on choice. In the Oristaya by Aeschylus, every character has a personal choice to make. Agamemnon did not have to kill his daughter Iphigenia. Clytemnestra did not have to kill Agamemnon in revenge for her daughter's murder. Oriestes did not have to kill his mother Clytemnestra to avenge his father Agamemnon. Everybody had a choice. The Greek term pharmakon combines three meanings, remedy, poison, and scapegoat. Aeschylus uses the term in the Oristaya to refer to a drug that can either be remedy or a poison. It gets rid of illness either by killing the disease or killing the diseased. When Agamemnon sacrifices Iphigenia, his act epitomizes the dual-edged pharmacon. Since it cured the problem of winds needed to drive the ships but ended up causing death of the whole family. The pharmacon that we offered, Omar and Andrew, encompassed all three meanings. Prescribed to fight the tumor, Chemotherapy and radiation therapy would serve both as remedies and as poisons simultaneously. Basically, the treatment would destroy the tumor in one area as new ones erupted in a hundred others in brutal acts of ruthless, diabolical, vicious reciprocity. 
Of course, there was no hope for any improvement in survival. The poisonous side effects would land them in the hospital for weeks and months with their mouths and esophagus one big raw open wound. The third meaning of pharmacon refers to the ritual of human sacrifice. By testing experimental drugs in humans, knowing little about the risks and benefits involved, yet hoping to learn from observations made on the current subjects, were we not turning the societal demands, inner desires, conscious concerns and capricious arbitrary violence on Omar and Andrew in order to secure a better outcome for others in the future? We gave those awful treatments anyway because the alternative would be no less agonizing. Allowed to run amok, cancer is one of the most painful and horrifying diseases. The fundamental question for both Omar and Andrew related to making this impossible choice, succumb to the ferocity of cancer or seek refuge in palliative treatments that temporarily control a growing tumor, but come with their own set of excruciating side effects. Die from the disease or die from the treatment? Which would you choose? Why are these the only two choices? This is the question I'm asking. Why after 50 years of research, all this fancy work we do, including me, I'm blaming myself, I'm not blaming others, I can't look at myself in the mirror, I feel so ashamed. When this 22 year old boy is diagnosed with cancer, he turns to his mother and says, don't worry mom, just call Azra, she's on the cutting edge, she'll find a cure for me. There are mothers in this room. How do you feel? How, why are we doing this? Well, the answer is very simple for me. That we are always trying to treat the end stage disease. We need to diagnose cancer as early as possible. So how do we diagnose cancer early? Well, right now we try to do pap smears, we do mammograms, we do colonoscopies, we do PSAs. These are very gross measures. I am saying we should apply all the technology that has come up. Why are we using these old techno technologies today? We should be using current technology, implantable devices, imaging, scanning techniques, the biomarker detection and try to diagnose the first cell. Now, Umar and Andrew were so young, why would you even be thinking about looking for cancer in these people? Well, because no one is immune. Cancer is a risk for everybody, from birth to death. So the point is, we need to develop techniques to start monitoring the healthy uh, population from birth. But where are the resources? Where is the will? Why aren't we doing it now? Actually, it is being done. What I'm going to tell you is not from some fantasy voyage kind of movie, fantastic voyage movie. It is actually things that are happening. Think about the following. As soon as cancer begins, Cancer cells multiply more rapidly than normal cells, so they have to uh, attract a lot of nutrition to themselves. So they start making new blood vessels. As soon as new blood vessels form, the area becomes hot. Well, people are developing sheets. You go to sleep at night and you can be scanned for the appearance of a hot area. You can be standing in your shower in the morning and you will be scanned for the appearance of the first cell. There is a fit loo being developed where urine and stool samples will be taken directly from the toilet and examined for the presence of uh, colon cancer or uh, other diseases. In fact, there is a smart bra that is undergoing clinical trials which has hundreds of thermotactile sensors built into it. Women just have to wear this bra for an hour or two a week 
and it will be able to detect the changes that have occurred as a result of the earliest appearance, not something that appears on mammograms, but something much earlier than that. This is where technology needs to go. So, do not let me leave you with a doom and gloom feeling at all, because actually I predict sitting here today that all of the future in healthcare is going to be preventive. Rather than running after diseases, we will be proactive. Every disease we are going to try and diagnose early. Why and how? How is the most important thing? By treating, not just doing periodic annual examinations or measures, but rather treating the human body as a machine that has to be constantly monitored. In fact, my, one of my colleagues, friends who I work with very closely, Dr. Leroy Hood in Seattle, uh, calls it welderly, the well elderly, how we are going to age, but that is very important for me because I am there. I <laughs> will end just by reading to you one last thing because this evening is dedicated to empathy. And I think that we have become a very indifferent science. Medicine is the most social of sciences and cancer especially so. So, I am going to end by reading two passages about the mothers of these two boys I talked about. Omar, 38 years old, who is dying of cancer and Andrew. Nahib, Alena. Some sorrows are unfathomable, language incapable of expressing them. What combination of letters could possibly speak the unspoken thoughts of the mothers, Nahid and Alena, as they bid unhurried farewells to the serially dying parts of the creatures they birthed and nurtured for decades? The anguish has no beginning and no end, no relief, no ascent or descent, no respite collapsing past, present and future into one bottomless pit. A new language needs invention to encompass the defenselessness, the vulnerability of these two mothers who with utmost delicacy ease their boys into the grave one piece at a time, each over a period of 16 months, tormented until their child's last breaths about how to make the bewildering segmented departure less painful. Omar had seven surgeries to remove slices of arms and lungs, a cancer filled shoulder. In Andrew's case, first the limbs went, followed by the bowel and bladder, then his eyesight, and in a final insult, he could swallow no more. To dare to mourn with Nahid and Elena, one must own the sorrows of the universe. No linguistic hyperbole can do justice. Language itself becomes speechless. Vocabulary held hostage by the raw agony of such incalculable scales. The infinite care with which Elena washed, scrubbed and dressed the wasted limp body of her 23 year old or the relentless, whacking, blistering, piercing, frightful terrors haunting Nahid in every waking hour and in sleep, deplete the hubris of death, elevate the status of motherhood to where the stars lower their gaze. One spark of pain in the heart of these mothers eclipses the glory of the sun. Dust raised by their ag agitation conceals deserts, their tears forcing an actual river to recede, dragging its forehead obsessively in front of their grief. Hota hai neha gard mein sehra mere piche aur ghista hai jabhi khaak pe darya mere aage. Next to me, the wilderness is shamed into hiding. The servile river grovels in the dust before me. Thank you.
Thank you.